The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, let's do a sound check real quick. Test one, two, three, four. All right, good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 18th, 2018, and this is a week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. So what do we talk about? Well, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind, hang on to those until we get to the live charts, which will be in a few minutes after we go over a few things here. And in also, and this is for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time. The reason I want you to hold off on your stock picks is because they'll get buried with all the other questions and I might not see them. But if you hold off to the end and then ask about one at a time, I'll get to as many as possible. And we should be able to get to nearly all of them this week. All right, what are we talk about? Well, I have so much to talk about since it's been so long since we've done a show. I want to do a Bitcoin update and I think it's going to be a pretty cool update if I say so myself. I want to talk a little bit about tracking trades. Got a lot of people coming into the service right around the beginning of the year. They've never seen the spreadsheet before. So I want to spend a little time talking about that and then give you some references on that. Now, one thing I've been dealing with lately is some major life crises or however you say it, some major life crises. We'll talk about that in one second. And for me, it's been a bit of a, an epiphany. But there are quite a few caveats in that, and that, that'll make more sense in a few minutes, obviously. And one thing I've been working on lately, I've gotten back into my trading psychology course, this master course I've been working on forever. But the latest thing I've worked on, especially this week, is performance benchmarking and general comparison of performance. And that'll make a lot more sense when we get to it. Now, before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up all predictions or about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then now for those of you who aren't on the newsletter or haven't read the newsletter yet i've been a little AL, awl lately and that's and uh, charlie said you know it's better that you share them then uh, keep them to yourself so everybody will understand what's going on. My father was diagnosed with acute leukemia not that long ago. And my mother, right around the same time, was diagnosed with lymphoma. My father, unfortunately, uh, did not make it after a very hard but uh, short fight. And my mother is now fighting the lymphoma. And what I've been doing is, so far, it seems like uh, pretty much going to split my time up between my main office here and my sister's office. So I have a second office now set up over there. Whether or not I'm going to do the week of charts on my on weeks over there while I'm helping my mom out, I'm not sure just yet. But I bought a big computer monitor and a tiny little computer, and the, the computer is going to go in the back, and I've got a stand-up desk on its way. So I'm going to have a full functioning office uh, over there, and so far it's worked out nicely. And I'm excited that I've, I've had the freedom to be able to do such a thing. Not that there's a lot of freedom in this business because it's a lot of work, but the good news is I can work anywhere in the world as long as, of course, I have an Internet connection. Now, this brings up the question about trading around a midlife crisis, that if you have trading full circle, of course, you'll know that I talked about the fact that that's usually a bad idea. Well, now that I'm actually going through something so uh, traumatic, at least for me, and I know we all eventually go through this, and a lot of you have, have reached out to me and, and, and told me your stories, and I realize that everybody goes through this at some point in their life, these traumatic type of things, but once you actually live through it, it becomes a little bit different. Now, for me, as I said a second ago, it's been a bit of kind of an epiphany because all of a sudden, trading isn't that important, and getting stopped out doesn't really bother me anymore. And I find myself watching the screen less and just following the plan. 
And it's not as hard to follow the plan lately because I have focus to focus on other things. And I've also been doing uh, some things to kind of get my mind off of things, such as burying myself deep into projects and getting into one thing I've been studying about lately is flow, uh, which is, um, I don't have the book in front of me. I might have it here. Uh, and that's important in getting into that flow zone, working on projects, whether it be your actual placing of the trades or taking the orders, or placing the orders, I should say, or working on some sort of project. And I'll, I'll talk more and more about that in time. But it's created this need for me to, to have this severe, uh, not severe, but uh, concentrated focus on what I'm doing now. Before I get digress too far, I often preach about preach against trading around major life events. And as a general statement, I would say don't do it, especially if you're not experienced. Now, what you can do is use that downtime to get educated. And there's a lot of downtime in my particular case, uh, time in hospitals, time in chemo wards, etc. And by the way, if you um, if you ever get a little too full of yourself or <laughs> you think your problems are important, go go hang out in the chemo ward for a little while. But do use that downtime to get educated and use it as a distraction. Okay, my projects have been a big distraction for me lately. Today's chart show is a distraction preparing for today's, today's chart show, etc. But don't actually put hard-earned dollars in the line if you've got a lot going on. Now, if you're experienced, I think it's okay to continue trading from personal experience, but put systems in place to make following that plan easier. Use alert, alerts, uh, timers, etc., whatever it takes, and then go about your life. Place the trades and then go away. As I often say, busy traders make good traders. So in this particular case, uh, it's, it's just another thing to keep me busy. And the trading, at least following the plan part, has actually gotten a lot better. And the psychological emotions of, like I said, getting stopped out or even on a, on a, on a positive side, the euphoria on a good trade, it just doesn't seem to, it seems I'm a lot more antiseptic now. I'm a lot more flippant. These things that I often preach about being, it seems to be actually easier. So your mileage may vary. But one thing that I find is that my screen time has been reduced significantly. And in doing so, and I always preach this, the more, the least screen time you have, a lot of times the better off you are. And so my point here is that your trading might actually get better by reducing your screen time. Your emotions will certainly be less because you'll go through less cycles. Let's say you have a stop in place. Let's say you have a hard stop in place. So you follow the plan, you're being a good boy, and let's say the market corrects sharply, but doesn't quite get to that stop. And then by the time you get around to looking at your screen, you'll find yourself thinking, oh, well, that's interesting. It sold off hard, but it already came back. So it becomes almost a positive observation. But if you're sitting there watching it, it would become a very negative observation. And you might be tempted to pull the plug early to sort of stop the cornage, stop the bleeding, however you want to look at it. So that's one thing I would point out. And the less screen time you have, the less temptation you will have to micromanage. And again, you're going to have less stress on the trade. So let's say let's say you do follow your plan, but you're watching that every little tick go down to that stop and then finally get stopped out. Well, now you have multiple, multiple, multiple observations, multiple negative observations instead of just allowing yourself to get stopped out and having that one negative observation. Anyway, that's uh, my two cents on that. Any questions on trading around major life events? If you guys want to share some of these things with me personally, feel free to do so because I'm sure this is not the last that you're going to hear about this. Okay. As I said earlier, thank you, Aaron. As I said earlier, I'm getting a lot of questions about tracking trades. Now, I know I've talked about this quite a bit, but I thought it would be important to go just really quickly through the open portfolio 
to give you an idea of what we're trying to accomplish and how we track it. So the open portfolio has a perpetual hypothetical 100K. Now, what the hell does that mean? Well, it means it's always 100K in the account. And that's just to keep the math easy. Obviously, if you were to take this spreadsheet, which I'll give you, by the way, I'll give you a copy of it. It, it won't be up to date, but it'll be it'll have all the formulas already in it for you. And you can feel free to use it. Just shoot me an email if you're interested in that. And also, if you're interested in a lot of details, obviously, I go through a lot of details in this in trading full circle. And also, there, I will show you how to do a, a search in a minute on my website, and you can get a lot of information on money management, and that's for free. Trading full circle, obviously, is not, but it'll get you up to speed a lot quicker. So anyway, 100K, always 100K, and then we're going to risk 2% per trade, and that's if stopped out. So on a dollar basis, that comes to $2,000 risk per trade. We're not going to buy $2,000 worth of stock. We're going to buy whatever amount of stock it takes, but we're going to only risk $2,000 if stopped out. Now, that'll make more sense in one second. Let me just show you that. So in this particular case, you can see that the stop was 85 cent away. So if we do all the math on that and divide 2000 by 85 cents, it's going to come up to a little over 2000 shares, 2300 shares and change. Notice that the share size here and here is one fourth the size or less because the stop is four times greater. Why is the stop four times greater? The price is higher and the volatility is likely higher in this particular case or certainly the price is higher and this is what it dictates now how do you set the stop that's the next question well i've got a few articles out there on my website and again i'll show you how to search in one second and that's one thing to do and uh, to to get up to speed and also if you take a look at the trading full circle we we'll spend a lot of time just on setting stops it is an art and it is a science you have to take take into consideration the price of stock the volatility of stock where would you likely be wrong? And also, is there any technical factors that might come into play? And that kind of dovetails in with where you might be wrong. Let's say you're playing the first, let's say you have a big base and you have a breakout. And again, I don't want to turn this into a stop lesson, but let's say you have a breakout and a pullback and you get long and it pulls back into that base. Well, somewhere in that base, would be a good place for a stop or maybe even on top of the base because that would be a point where you have failed. If you're trading a transitional pattern, let's say off a low and the stop begins to take off, well, maybe down around that old low would be a place of failure on the trade. So that's both technical and a place of failure, kind of dovetails together. So that stops in a nutshell, and that's why they're going to vary quite a bit based on the volatility and the price of the stock and other technical factors just discussed. Now, so the new setups are down here. The existing portfolio is up top. And what we do is we divide the position into two. Now, you would buy, let's say, let's make this like round numbers down here. Let's just say this was 400. You would buy all 400 shares at once, but for tracking purposes, you would put 200 in the trading loaf and 200 in the trending loaf. And I was thinking about this right before I went live. By having this physical representation of two half positions, it makes it a lot easier to make the trade. When you're looking at the whole position in your portfolio and you're going to sell half, it's a little bit different. It feels a little weird sometimes, like why am I selling half while this market is doing well? And it's a little bit more, it's a little harder psychologically, but if you are looking at your spreadsheet and you're like, okay, I've hit my goal on this first loaf, so I'm going to go ahead and flip them out. It's a lot easier to just follow through when you have it right in front of you and you look at it long ahead of time. And I don't want to digress too far. I know, imagine that, me digress. But the bottom line is the more you kind of wrap your head around things and plan things and then ideally do a little mind sculpting and rehearsing the the trade, knowing that, okay, I'm going to go in, a little self-talk maybe, I'm going to go in 
and I'm going to have this trading loaf where I'm looking for a 1% gain. I'm risking 2%. I'm looking for a 1% gain. And I'm going to hold on to the second half of this position and gradually loosen my stop and hopefully be in this position for a long, long time. So you do a little self-talk, mind sculpting, whatever you want to call it ahead of time. Have it all in front of you in a spreadsheet and your life will get a lot easier. Now, let's fast forward to, uh, I just grabbed the portfolio I found on my PC that had uh, bigger profits in the open position. And I don't even know what day this was. It was sometime last year. And if you take a look at this, you'll see that the trading loaf was a 1% gain. Remember, this is a $100,000 hypothetical. So you have a $1,000 dollar gain that's our swing trade it turned out to be a 22 percent gain in stocks this percentage isn't hugely important obviously we're more worried about the numbers going into our account and hopefully not too big a numbers going out but that's a trading loaf and the reason we take that trading loaf is we don't know that this, this is going to turn into a trending setup and i'm going to take a look at that in just one second about how you could put yourself through the money management into a state of regret and that's one thing i've been thinking about a lot lately there's probably a whole article in that uh in the psychology of the money management i think my my money management has a very strong psychological backing to it as i've written quite a bit because it kind of fulfills that maslow's hierarchy of needs both the short-term need to be right and need to make money and both the long-term kind of self-actualization thing as you kind of climb up that ladder to be right big and then there's also a statistical aspect to it, too. Being right big is very important longer term. Without those big winners, you're not going to do very well in this business. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but you can get in a lot of trouble with systems that only make a little bit of money because sooner or later, a little bit of money per trade, that is, because sooner or later, you're going to get hit really hard. And those are so-called anthill type of systems. Now, the way we beat the perceived negative expectancy of a one-for-one uh, on your first loaf would be to make some multiple thereof on your second loaf of the trade. And that's the trending loaf. And hopefully, and I know I just said hold, but hopefully you stay with that trade for a long, long time. And that number becomes much bigger than your initial risk. All right. Anyway, I kind of zip through that. If you go to my website and type in money management up top, there's a lot more information. Uh, I came up with about 100 hits on that. The first couple of articles that come up are pretty good. I would go after those first. I have the art and science of setting stops. I found that a couple of days ago on my website. So I probably need to uh, clean that up and repurpose it and, and post it. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be one of my next articles that I put up. And also, you might want to search for stops. And if you go to my website, the search button, there's a little magnifying glass right under here. And then when you pull this, when you click on this, this big window comes up here. And it's pretty cool if I say so myself. And I have a lot of information out there. Speaking of my website, you go to my website now, you'll notice there's an annoying little pop down when you uh, hit my website. And I have the trading full circle course on sale. If you wanted to jump in and take advantage of that sale, I think it's on sale till next Monday, probably Monday, like a or Tuesday morning, like really early in the morning, maybe 4 a.m. Uh, just so people in other time zones can take advantage of this. But if you're interested in it, just go to my website and click on a banner ad. If you want to know what it's all about, you could actually go here and you could watch some of the videos for free. And you'll get a video, I think, every day. And there's a lot of good stuff in the intro videos. I've gotten a lot of good uh, feedback on that, too. So I want to make sure you get a good introduction to the methodology, the trading psychology, the money management, and everything in those four or five videos in the intro. So check that out. Now, let's do a Bitcoin update. And as I've said before, it's kind of a buyer beware type of thing. And it's still the wild, wild west. Now, the exchanges are still questionable. And this slide is left over from about three months ago or two and a half months ago, whenever it was, I last did a show. 
And back then I said there's some robustness questions. Robustness. Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> Kraken. I tried to get in my Kraken account last week and it was down and they had a very cryptic message on the website saying they were down for maintenance. And it was uh, not much details. And I, I got a screenshot of it, but I couldn't find it. I, I don't have it on this computer. I'm sorry. It's on my uh, other computer. I'm going to have to make better use of uh, my Microsoft OneDrive and Google Drive and all these other tools that I've been working on. And that's been kind of a cool thing is to become more and more mobile and be able to just pop up anywhere and, uh, and hit the ground running. But anyway, Kraken was down. Luckily, I had gotten stopped out of all my positions. I had a little small token position just for kind of shits and giggles that I left open, a free position, so to speak, but very token amount. Um, and this is why I've been saying just tread lightly. I would make sure you have open up multiple accounts and don't put your life savings in any of this stuff. But it's been a fun ride trading these cryptos, and I'm going to show you some trades here in just one second. And again, as I've been saying quite a bit, my goal is not to show you every crypto trade I make, but to show you how trading is trading. Now, before I get too far ahead of myself, again, it's still a wild, wild west. As some things I've been saying lately, or last year at least, the fees are ridiculous when you're trying to get in. Once you get in, though, I don't find the trading fees that bad. I tend to ignore fees. It's kind of like death and taxes. Uh, you got to pay them. And I try not to let anything that has nothing directly to do with trading interfere with my trading. And the, the cryptos are still seen as dubious. I guess the exchanges are somewhat questionable, as we saw last week. And they are. Uh, one thing that I am seeing, though, is now that the Chicago, is it Chicago Merck or, or CBOT? I forget. I think it's a Merck started contracts on Bitcoin itself. Bitcoin has been become more choppy. And I've been trading the other currencies more ever since. Now, here's the good news. Your top wallets and exchanges. GDAX, and I hate to say it, but Kraken. <laughs> uh, I'm, I haven't used offline wallets uh, just yet. I should. I know I should. But uh, I'm a trader, and I need that money to be uh, in that account to, uh, to trade. And once you make a trade, you well, unless you, I guess you'd have to go through a little rigmarole, but you could get the money out, uh, I suppose, onto your wallet. Now, the good news is, yeah, I don't want to turn this into a crypto uh, speech other than, than I think tread lightly and use technical analysis. And technical analysis works really, really well. And that's the great thing. Now, let's take a look at ripple for instance and ripple for instance as example took off and it made a little bit of a pullback and i was able to get a buy off at this area here right around 109 now this looks like three orders this is just one i don't want to say a big order but one order filling on three different fills right about 109 as you can see for all intents and purposes and here are the actual cells, and these two cells here, this is just one one position being sold, and this was a take profit that got filled in one big chunk. And what I did was I sold half. It's like, well, Dave, it took off from there. Why would you sell half? Well, I didn't know it was going to keep going, so I scaled out, as we discussed earlier. And then recently I got stopped out on the remainder of the position. So it was kind of a so long and things for all the fish. And what I did was I gradually let that stop open up. Let's redo that. As I preach, you had to stop. I guess the stop was in here somewhere. And then I kind of let that gradually followed it up and then kind of let it open up and then got stopped out at that level. Now I don't see anything to be done in this currency for a long, long time. So this was a nice little bubble and it came right back in. Everybody and their brother said it was a bubble. Everybody and their brother was right. But you don't get paid to pontificate, you get paid to trade. So here's a case with Ethereum. Now I find Ethereum right now, and I'm gonna show you a potential trade here in just one second if you're interested. 
uh, buy beware, obviously, and all those other disclaimers at the beginning of this presentation, too. But Ethereum so far has traded a lot more cleanly, at least as of late. And I think this was a, I forget what trading I've done back here, but I was, uh, there, I think there was some trades that this was like a double top knockout back here. And then um, I believe if memory serves, I got stopped out here. I can look at my trades from last year. And then I got a re-entry on the trade. And it's kind of hard uh, psychologically buying a market that's two times higher than it used to be. But sometimes that's what you should do. So we got to buy here on the pullback and that's about 780 was the fill or 780 exactly was the fill and you could see it meandered a little bit but it did take off and then we took profits around 950 because we didn't know it was to keep on going or not and then i got stopped out now you might be saying why did you give up so much well two things um, this exchange does not allow for hard stops and I was actually with my wife at the time, and I was not going to place a trade on a cell phone. I just, I'm just not going to do it uh, in cryptocurrencies, at least. And it did get stopped out, but so what? Okay, it stopped out at a profit. Yes, I left a lot of money on the table, but so what? Now, Here was a Bitcoin trade from a while back, and you could see in trend following mode, it got stopped out. And then there was a buyback right around that level. Now, sometimes it's hard, like I said, to get stopped out of a trade and turn around and get right back in. But notice you've got a nice accelerated uptrend and you've got a nice deep pullback. Okay. And that's pretty obvious trade there. Now, I did an add-on trade to the Bitcoin after getting stopped. I'm sorry, I jumped back in. I got stopped out here, and then I entered somewhere around here, and then got stopped out at this level here. And you can see so far, it's, it's kind of imploded from there. So this is a losing trade. I wanted to show you that not every trade is a winner. But as I said earlier, I think Bitcoin now has become more efficient meaning that there's a lot of players in the market now. There's derivatives now, and you can see it's it has begun to trade a little wide and loose, and it's going to be a while before I'll be trading Bitcoin again, at least on the long side. Now, here's a trade I wanted to show you, and I have an open order in on this one. I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but it's somewhere in here, and you can see you've got a nice kind of a TKO type of move, nice pullback. And just in case Phil's joining us today, Phil likes the 50-day moving average. I thought it'd be fun to put the 50-day moving average in here. If you have the layman's guide to trading stocks, I talk about daylight pullbacks or Dave light pullbacks in there. And that's where you look for a market to trade above its moving average. The lows have to be above the moving average for a set amount of days. And then you look for a pullback below the average, and then you look to get long on that pullback. In this particular case, it's down to Phil's favorite, the 50-day moving average. So that's a pretty cool looking trade. And again, I have open orders on that one, full disclosure. All right, let's see what the questions are. Is there a Bitcoin ETF? No, there's a, a stock, and I forget the name of the stock. It's a penny stock, XV, somebody uh, help me out. Um, I've never traded it because it's a penny stock, but there is a, a stock that has invested in it, okay? Yeah, GDAX is, uh, GDAX fees are, 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 aren't too bad, but when you're getting into, when you're buying the actual, uh, when you're getting money into the account, they, they rip you off. They all do. Okay, the um, GBTC, is is I'm, I'm making air quotes is a bitcoin etf technically i think it's not really an etf but it's sort of a proxy for bitcoin and then obviously there are bitcoin futures but then there's all kinds of problems that come along with with trading a derivative type of product okay all right one thing i want to talk about is is benchmarking and 
this benchmarking has come up lately. When you're trading a trend following system, you you really can't put some sort of set goal that you're going to make. And you can't really define exactly how much you're going to make. It's just not possible. You do have to position yourself to make as much money as possible and to try to keep losses in check. In longer term, you'll be pleasantly surprised. And one thing that's hard with trend following, it's hard for me, it's hard for anyone, I would imagine, is the fact that you really rely on these outliers to make your year. One or two or three big trades makes all the difference in the world. In the past, as I've said ad nauseum, I've had portfolios, sometimes nine or ten stocks in a portfolio. All of them are doing well. All of them hit the initial profit target. And then they all stop out and most of them stop out. It's like, well, that's a pretty decent run. There's nothing wrong with that. It feels good because you made, you were very right over a short period of time. But I would actually rather be, I don't want to be more wrong, but I'd actually rather make more money and be less right. That's a positive way of framing it. So it gets a little tough when you're trend following. And there are times where the market just goes up. And as you saw in the portfolio a little while ago, I wanted to show that portfolio because it actually was not in a plus column. And I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully I'll be doing a presentation in a few weeks or a few months and I'll be able to bring that same portfolio up and show how by following the plan, a couple of those stocks paid off big and made it all worthwhile. But I would, I would encourage you to be careful about benchmarking. And psychologically benchmarking the only thing benchmarking will do is put you in a negative frame of mind and one thing you have to realize psychologically and this is something i've been studying a lot psychologically a negative has twice the effect of a positive let me repeat that psychologically a negative has twice the effect of a positive so if you're comparing yourself to someone else or to a benchmark or some sort of thing that, that you feel like you should be beating or doing as well as, when you are beating it, you're going to get a little bit of feeling good. A little dopamine's going to drop into your system. You're going to feel okay about that. But when you're not beating it, the negative emotion that comes with it is going to be twice as, as big. So that's where it becomes somewhat dangerous. And that's one of the things, not to digress, but to, when they're studying gambling behavior, you get that high from the win, but then the loss is twice as big. So you've got to work much, much harder to try to get that high again, and that high just doesn't pay off as much. It's the same thing with any type of drugs. You know, who was, uh, what's the band that's saying uh, it used to take one, now it takes four, you don't get me high anymore. Well, that's all, you know, that person must have, uh, that band must have studied some freshman psychology when it comes to the dopamine and how it works. You build up a resistance to things when it comes to when it comes to drugs, when it comes to trading, when it comes to anything. And I think benchmarking helps to put you into that negative mindset. So you want to be very careful about benchmarking. Compare yourself only to you. I found this quote by accident yesterday from Theodore Roosevelt. I thought it was pretty good. Comparison is the thief of joy. So I would encourage you to compare yourself only to yourself. Make sure you did the best that you can do for you. I'm not a golfer, but if I was, I, I was briefly for a while, but if I was, I wouldn't go out and say, I'm going to try to play as good as Tiger Woods. I know that's not going to happen, but if I, if I were playing at least as good as I could play, I think I would feel good about that so when you're trading you want to make sure you followed your plan you want to make sure you picked the best did the rest and as long as you did those things and did like a serious very honest post-mortem afterwards all these things i'm talking about in the psychology part of trading full circle then pat yourself on the back and don't worry about anyone else now i knew greg morris had had written about this in his book so i dug out his book yesterday and i found this no benchmark exists for trend following that uses stops and treats cash as an asset class. 
So it's kind of interesting. Greg's very cerebral. And if you think about that, let's say you've got an index that goes up. It drops 50 percent, but then goes up. Like I said, to go up 100 percent and change to get back to, to break even plus. But let's say you have an index. And it has a very big. A very big drawdown looks something like that and then goes on and goes up. Well, let's say the net net move is plus 10 percent. Well, if you're trying to follow along, you're going to get stopped out somewhere in here and then maybe get back in somewhere in here. And you might only be up a few percent. Plus, you have a loss here. OK, so that's why he's talking about using stops. Like Dave, you saying don't use stops? No, use stops. You have to use stops. I remember the first time that I developed a mechanical system that worked. It worked well, I should say, or my dad. I decided, well, I can't wait to put stops in it to see how much better it's going to work because that's going to control my losses. Well, I'll put stops in and the system stop working, okay? Because the system was staying long through abysmal drawdowns and the market came back. Well, trust me, the market won't always come back, so you will have to have stops in place. So that's the point that Greg's trying to make and treats cash as an asset class, meaning that it's OK to be out of the market. And when you're out of the market, you're not going to be making any money when you're stopped out. And then he goes on to say, personally, I don't think that there will ever be. So I think that's great words of wisdom from Greg. You always get something good out of Greg. Now, the psychology of money management is kind of dovetailing into this conversation and this is one thing i've been thinking about a lot lately now if you're following my method of method method of money management that's a mouthful then we're taking partial profits for a swing trade and then we're holding on to a piece for what hopefully becomes a longer term trade. Now, by the time we take those partial profits, our stop has been moved up to break even. Now, I went into this in a lot of detail in trading full circle. And I think it's important, and this is uh, something I'm working on for the master psychology course, is that there's a big psychology in the fact that you put yourself into a state of regret because you compare yourself against that trade in perfect hindsight and say, damn it, I could have taken that full amount and you get stopped out on the remainder. But overall, you still made money on the trade and there's nothing wrong with making money on the trade. And as I've said quite a bit, we'll have a lot of trades that look like this. This will happen several times in a row where we get that profit target stop out, profit target stop out, profit target stop out. OK. And then my clients will ask me, well, Dave, why don't we take 100 percent on that swing trade? And it's like, well. Because we're never going to make 200 percent or 300 percent or 40 percent on a trade when that trade does begin to take off. Now, let's say that you're in a trade, you take your partial profits like a good little trend follower, you bring your stop up, and then the trade begins to take off. Well, now you have a regret because you only have a half a position on now. Now, just like I got emails when we stopped out a lot like this, profit, stop out, profit, stop out, profit, stop out. When this happens a couple times in a row, I get a lot of emails saying, hey, Dave, why don't we just keep 100 percent on? Well, this doesn't happen that often. So we have to be willing to take that partial profit. Now, it's, it's funny. I go back doing this presentation as I'm looking at that trade and I think it was Bitcoin or whatever down at five thousand, six thousand. I'm taking profits. I'm like, good Lord, that thing went to twenty thousand. Boy, I, I, I wish I could have just held on to that. Well, you can't put yourself into that state of regret, you have to benchmark against yourself and be proud of the fact that you followed the plan and you got out half of your position when you were supposed to. So you're in a state of regret then. Now let's say that 
you take your partial profits just like we did last time. And then again, the market begins to take off and you're like, damn it. I wish I had a full position on still. But you're being a good little trend follower and your stop has been trailed up higher. And then you stop out. Well, we talked about this quite a bit in trading full circle. All trades eventually end badly. You're either going to get stopped out of the loss, stopped out after getting a small profit or maybe something in between, or in the end, stopped out of a trade. But if you were fortunate enough to get in a trade here and get out here, you know, erase all this from your memory, okay? You made a lot of money on that trade, but instead, what are you focusing on? You're focusing on the fact that you lost this much money in the end, okay? So you want to compare yourself against yourself and nothing else. Did you follow the plan as best as possible? And if you did, then pat yourself on the back. Now, I would also encourage you to avoid comparison against others. And I got to thinking about this yesterday and it says, okay, well, let's play a little game. Let me get on Facebook and see how long it takes me to find some bullshit. And I wish I would have held my breath in the process just to see if I could have held my breath that long because it was only a few seconds until I found this. $425 equals 10 minutes of work. And you can see that quote right there. And then you got this moron, and he's not a trend-following type. He's just a flat-out moron. And he's holding up a little easy button, okay? I guess he's in his mom's basement or wherever, but that, that's, that's an inference. Uh, and he made $425 in 10 minutes. So he's implying it's, it's just that easy. Well, it's not that easy. It's a lot of work. And you have to be realistic. And every now and then you will make $425 in 10 minutes. But that's not the norm. So if you're newer to trading, if it smells like bullshit, it probably is. So don't compare yourself to others. Only compare yourself to yourself. Now, these random thoughts are left in from a couple of months ago. But it's interesting. And we'll look at this when we get to the charts. But yesterday we had... We had an outside day down, which means that you have a bar, it opened strong and closed poorly. Um, I guess in candle speak, that's a fat man who just ate a little baby looking out a window or whatever. But there were a lot of fear mongering, like, ah, that's the top. Well, what happened the following day is that we went back up and actually closed at all time highs. Yes, winter is coming. One day this market will top out, okay? Predict early and often, I suppose. And I think the slide is left over from last summer when I got a little nervous, when things were beginning to roll over a little bit. I thought that was it. Did I sell a farm? No. I hung on because I had stops in place. But I did eye up a short or two, and I think I squeezed one or two off. Got burn on them, but that's okay. That's what you do as a trend follower. So don't try to outsmart the market. The best thing you do is just continue to follow along because winter is coming, but not quite yet. And just be a trend-following moron and don't try to outsmart the market. A market can stay. Is a market irrational right now? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. But Keynes once said, a market could stay irrational a lot longer then you could remain solvent. And that's where I got into this big debate with this gentleman, and he called me a moron, a trend-following moron, because he was fighting a market that was going straight up, and I was just drawing big blue arrows on the chart and following along. All right. Hard to benchmark against moving target the value of cash. Um. Well, what are you saying? The currency fluctuates? I'm not sure what you're saying there. Okay, this is an inter this is interesting. Can you uh I don't I don't have a name uh for you, but uh whoever 
wrote this. Could you send me something on this? Studies with kids shows that a negative has seven times the effect of a positive. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, let's let's talk about that. Let's. Uh, I'd like to flesh that out further. So send send that to me, please. BLOK and BLCN are connected to Bitcoin or Block. All right, we'll take a look at those in just one second. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. While we're doing that, if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. And I want to take a look at some sector action. And once we do that, we could pop out into your individual stock questions. All right, let's start off with let's start off, start off with the P's. S&P 500. Now, S&P 500, let me clean this up a little bit. S&P 500, as I just said, had this outside day down a couple days ago. Everybody in that brother was fear-mongering, and then look what happened yesterday. We closed at all-time highs. By the way, You'll often hear me talk about this. I learned this many years ago that a close, a closing high, it's a little stealthy because it's beneath the actual high, which was right here. A closing high is kind of cool and psychologically it's very important. Now we're giving it up a little bit today, but day ain't over yet. I don't know. Who knows? We're due for a correction. I would actually would welcome a TKO type of move, provided, of course, my portfolio doesn't get hurt too much in the process. But I think we could almost use a TKO type of move. Sharp sell off, everybody in the world freaks out, and then the market goes right back up. If you go to my website under videos, uh, you can get... Um, you can get a video on the uh, TKO, okay? And I'll show you where that is in just one second. Let's move this over here. But right now would be a good time to brush up on a TKO pattern. Maybe next week we'll talk about it a little bit. But in the meantime, if you go to my website, and here's the trading full circle reminder. But if you go to videos right here and you click on Scroll down a little bit, you'll see a picture of me in front of a shark. It might load slow. I'll get it up in a second. Oh, here it is. Right here. This one right here. It's on YouTube. And it's me in front of the shark here. And I talk about the psychology of the pattern. Everything I do, by the way, has a psychological backing to it. Anyway, NASDAQ Composite could also use a TKO. Outside day down two days ago, nice little recovery yesterday, closed at all-time highs off a smidge today. Again, not to beat the dead horse, but this market sure could use a correction, okay? And when it does, everybody's going to freak out, and guess what? You will have to honor your stops just in case. You get stopped out, so be it, okay? He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. It's an old hedge fund adage. Now, Russell, not quite as impressive. Outside day down, bit of a bummer there because it brought us back to our prior little breakout in here. A little bit of recovery yesterday, not quite to all-time highs, unfortunately. A little bit of sell-off today. We don't seem to be getting that, that massive January effect that sometimes you'll get in a Russell 2000. But I wouldn't count it down and out just yet. Maybe if it gets below the 50, maybe if the bow ties roll over, then I might get a little concerned. Maybe if it pulls all the way back and gets stuck in this base down here, if it comes back here, does this, does that, then I get a little concerned, okay? If the net-net price change gets kind of ugly to where it's like just flat, like it was not that long ago, then I start to get concerned, then I'm becoming a little concerned. But for now, I'm not going to get too excited. Now, as we go through these sectors, you can see that's energies, that's metals and mining, and then some areas within metals and mining. Banks banging out new highs in here, just off new highs as of today. Insurance right at brand new highs. I can go on and on. A couple of areas not doing so hot, such as real estate. Well, that's no big shocker. 
because real estate is what? Interest rate sensitive. Utilities, same sort of thing there. Big blue arrow pointing down in utilities. Those would be two areas. If you wanted to short something, then knock yourself out. I'm not too excited about shorting anything in a bull market, but hey, if you're looking to put on some shorts, that would be two good areas to consider. I'd much rather just hang on to my longs in a bull market. Speaking of interest rates, here's bonds. Surprisingly, bonds are kind of hanging in there. They're all over the place today notwithstanding. But I wouldn't get too excited about bonds. Now, with bonds, you have to remember, bonds down, rates up, right? But with bonds, you have to remember that it's not the absolute level of the bond or the absolute interest rate. I mean, I'm sure at some point it, that will make a difference. But with bonds, it's more of the delta. So when you see a big drop in bonds, the market gets a little skittish because it means that interest rates are on the rise. So pay attention to that delta or rate of change of the descent, and that's going to be concerning. But you can see it's just kind of chopping all over the place. Today is getting whacked, but eh, tomorrow it might be right back up. So that's what's going on with bonds. Okay. Benchmarking to the value of cash, say you're up 10%, your portfolio of a currency drops 12%, you can be a great trader, win big time, lose well. Well, yeah, I mean, but that that risk is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You can't do anything about that unless unless you're also trading currencies and you're, you've got a sell signal in your currency and you're making money on a short side in your currency. Now, I'm not saying go out and hedge. But I'm saying that if the dollar, let's say the dollar is tanking, then you might have had a sell signal in the dollar and that might be helping things. But I hear what you're saying. What if your currency loses value? That that is that is always a problem. But as as a normal trader, as a, as a, just a pure stock trader, there's nothing you can do about that. And again, if you're trading currencies also, then maybe you might end up short a particular currency or short some other currencies or long some other currencies. And that might help to balance things out. But as long as you did your trade as you should and you go from cash to trade, cash to trade or trade to cash, how you want to look at it, then don't get too caught up in benchmarking to yourself, to others or benchmark, I should say, only to yourself. OK, if you took a wild ass trade you shouldn't have taken, whether you made money or not, then, yeah, beat yourself up because that was something stupid to do. But if that trades within your methodology and you followed the plan and you had the plan to begin with, then by all means, feel good about what you did. But, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Okay. All right. Thanks for the well wishes. Okay. Gary was saying that block, B-L-O-K, and... What's the other one? Uh, BLCN, which we'll take a look at, or are connected to blockchain or Bitcoin. Okay. Well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna rename DaveLandry.com, DaveLandryBlockchain.com, and then uh, it'll probably be worth twice as much overnight. Now, so how do you train an IPO like this? Well, give yourself, give it a couple of days. Give it five days at least, and there's a pattern. You could be long in the fifth day from the IPO course, and then there's a pattern on my website, the uh, Dave Light IPO pattern, where you can be long on day six. So maybe keep this on your radar as something that you could do. I'd like to know what this is made of, so we'll have to do a little research on that. So let me just put a make a note. I'd like to know what components are in that. That'd be kind of fun to look at. And then Gary's also saying that BLCN, BLCN, okay, reality shares, NASDAQ, next generation economy. Okay. Well, that might be something else to watch, and it, it's going to come up in my IPO scan, so we'll keep an eye on it. So you might actually see me recommending these or not, depending on what they do. But thank you, Gary, for those. I appreciate it. What do you think about LX over 1590? We are long LX. Uh, yeah, fantastic looking trade. Absolutely. So he's saying that maybe around here somewhere, maybe give it a little bit more wiggle room closer to 16. Uh, there's two ways to play this one if you're interested. And again, full disclosure, we're long. OK, 
Okay, so I might be talking my position. One way to play it would be wait for a new closing high. Okay. Another way to play it would be, like you said, around 16 on just say you're playing that pullback. Okay. And then yet another way to play it would be use the Dave light. Let's put in a five day moving average. This is a five day simple moving average. Okay. And wait until you have daylight, meaning the low is greater than the moving average and a new closing high. So any close above, let's say 17 and a half will be a good point of reference or whatever this close is here. Well, let's, let's, let's get the numbers right. Any close above 17.29, okay? And the low is greater than the moving average. So there's three ways, there's three potential ways to play this trade. Okay, hope that helps. But yeah, absolutely. Good to see you too. CPAH as a TKO. CPAH. I'm not getting any names today, or very few names. Um, I'll have to look into that. Uh, did it just ask you for an email when you registered? Um, I don't like this big, huge bar right here. But yes, good eye. I mean, without that bar, would that be a TKO? Absolutely. You've got the, you got Dave Light in there. you got a nice TKO. So that looks kind of interesting. Uh, super duper thin, okay? So I'd be really careful, uh, and I don't, again, like that big, crazy bar. They probably they probably mentioned the word blockchain <laughs> or something. But, yeah, absolutely. Good eye on that. Super duper thin. I would pass because it's so thin and because you got this crazy bar. But, yeah, I like what you're seeing, at least shorter term. All right, WTI, that's going to be a, an oil field stock. And it looks good. It's trending. Uh, with today's action, it looks even better. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Let's, cl let's clean it up. Um, it doesn't have, it's got some bad memories back here, but that's that's a long time ago. I think I'd be willing to pass because I do like energies right now. I'd like a little bit more knockout, maybe down to four or something, but it's certainly not a bad, it's not a bad looking setup. If this knockout, today's knockout, were a little further down, you would definitely get a high five on that. Okay, EGAN. Um, well, it's not set up at the present time, okay? You had a little bit of a knockout move here, but it wasn't quite enough. One thing that, that I have a problem with, it sort of took off back here, and then it kind of drifted higher. Now, that's a pretty big drift, don't get me wrong, but it's not... It doesn't look like it's, it's not accelerating based on the way it took off, okay? But, yes, it's in a serious trend. But what I'd like to see is I'd like to see it break out decisively and then pull back a little bit, okay? So that needs to go on your momentum list, but I would not trade it as of today. EC. Yeah, this looks pretty good. It's got everything going for it. Look at the persistency. Let's let's just pick this one apart. You've got a nice persistent uptrend. You've got a nice accelerating persistent uptrend, and then you have a pullback. Now, the only thing I would like to see, and again, sometimes I could be a perfectionist, I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback based on the magnitude of this run. But yes, absolutely, put that on your watch list. So you guys, you guys have done really well without me. I'm impressed. And I, I can't see anybody's name. I can't see all the names. So that's a bummer. I can see John. John wants to talk about JT. Uh, I'm going to have to pass on this one. With the, maybe if it made new highs. Uh, that's kind of an IPO type of setup. So, yeah, possibly on new highs. And then I would revert you back to the uh, Dave Light would probably be the best way to play that one with the uh let me let me do a search in background here see if i can find it but i do have an article that walks through the pattern and i think i also have uh yeah there you go look at my website if you, if you search for daylight ipo there's a week of charts i did you could also find that's from uh eight last summer and again, if you go to videos, there's a uh, there's a video playlist of the weekend charts on the video page. So I would go in and brush up on that. Get the whole course if you want. 
S R R A. Come on. I got to find my screen in here. Let's see. Okay. Come on. Here we go. All right, let's clean this one up. This is kind of like, I just said I want a deeper pullback. This is kind of on the borderline of too deep. So it's kind of on the cusp. But it did make a nice run high. I would say this one's okay. It's getting a few too many days in the pullback. But I would say this one's okay. I don't like, I was looking at this one last night now that I see it. I don't like what happened back here. And remember, markets sometimes have long, long memories. If I was just looking at this, then I'd say, okay. Uh, what you might want to do is if you really like the stock and you decide you want to go with it, I passed because of this. But you might go back and see what happened way back here. And then, again, that's been two years and change or a year and a half at least. So maybe a lot of those bad memories have washed their way through the system. ALTR. Uh, it looks okay. I would have preferred if it could have cleared this prior range decisively before pulling back. It is still a new issue, so it, it can have potential. Uh, if this was a stock that's been out for a long time, I would say totally pass based on the fact that it um, pulled back into its breakout range. But as you know, I do trade IPOs a little bit with a breakout uh, characteristic, but I would try to find something better before I would go after that one. GDS. Yeah, that looks fantastic. Uh, this one is one that's been popping up on my radar quite a bit lately. Um, it's coming back fairly nicely today. My only problem with it, and then I've got today's, without, pretend that you don't have today's data in there. The reason that I didn't put this on my list last night was, even though I kind of got excited when I first saw it, I didn't like the way it pulled all the way back to its prior breakout, okay? Now, sometimes I could be a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to charts, and obviously so far so good it's doing okay. But when I began, when I first saw this one and my chart was backed out a little bit, I really liked it. But then as I kind of picked it apart, again, I didn't like the fact that it pulled all the way back to its prior base. So I would pass on that one, even though nothing wrong with it uh, big time. Maybe you would keep that on your uh, – your watch list. Siffy. This one's okay. HV kind of crazy high. Um, it needs a little bit more pullback. Obviously, un unfortunately, though, the pullback that I would require would put you back below this prior base. So let's see what happens. But maybe if it pulls back a little bit below 220 and not too far into its prior little, when I say base, I mean prior little breakout point. But uh, HV is kind of high. I mean, unless I just absolutely love a stock, usually I'll pass when the HV is over 100. I just always give them a second look. Okay. SMSI. Uh, it already triggered if you were playing the pullback, but it does. It's a little wide and loose, but it does have acceleration. Um, put it on your watch list, but I don't see it as a new setup. If you're long, stay long. SRNE. Um, put it on your watch list. It's obviously not pulled back yet, but yeah, it looks kind of interesting because it's in a nice trend. HV kind of high, so obviously be careful. 115 on that. BBD. Uh, no, this is a foreign bank. This would have to make new highs for me to get excited about it, okay, and then pull back. So I'd pass on that one, James. I mean, you could probably find something. Let's go to foreign banks just for S&Gs. Uh, you could probably find something in foreign banks that looks a little better than that. I mean, this one, but it'd have to accelerate higher. Let's see if we can find something for you. This one, GGAL, put that on your watch list. You know, maybe if it pulls back a little bit, it's a little thin. Uh, this one's breaking out nicely, maybe on a pullback. That one's just crazy. That's a little too crazy. 
That's kind of interesting. Uh, it's yeah, I would I wouldn't worry about the gaps because it's chopping around uh, because it's foreign stock. But this one on a pullback would be a, a better choice. That was what uh, KB. So you can see you have choices. Uh, ROI on a pullback. HV is a little low, but that's kind of interesting. So yeah, you have some choices there. You know, here's the deal too. A little quick lesson, a little teachable moment. When you find a stock you like in one sector or subsector, I should say, go in and look at the other stocks in the subsector, especially the ones that are tradable, and see if there's something that you like even better. So that's part of the treasure hunting process. Sometimes I'll find a biotech and I'll like it, and then I'll go dig through that whole sector, and then I'll find one that I really, really like that I love. Okay. Okay, um, I, your name is not here, but um, stock that starts with V, I can't talk about. It's on the Landry list today, but hey, good eye. High five on that one. Tesla for Dave, T-S-L-A, T-S, Tesla. No, it's too wide and loose and sideways, okay? It's, where is it, 350 now? Where was it back last June, 350? Draw your arrow. It's going sideways. For me to get excited about it, it would have to... Break out to new highs and then pull back. So it, I wouldn't even look at this stock until it's above 400. But I think you might be able to find something that's a little bit less efficient in the early phases of taking off. Intel, I'm not going to like done, probably. Intel's kind of big and thick. Yeah, see, Intel's all over the place. It's just kind of bouncing around this big range. HV, pretty low for a tech company. Um, I would go look in semiconductors. You could probably find something. I mean, semiconductors are blasting higher right now, so you could probably find – why would you trade a stock that looks like this, wide and loose, when semiconductors are blasting higher? I would imagine that we'll see a lot of semi soon. Verizon, I'm not going to like, probably. Big, thick stock. Uh, too many days of the pullback. HV kind of low. It barely got past its prior little peak in here. Just kind of all over the place. Not a – you know, it's electric cardiogram longer term. Yeah, it looks okay shorter term, and I, I get you. But longer term looks like electric cardiogram. BBD? Yeah, we talked about that one, didn't we? That's a foreign bank. Yeah, we got that one. Check the other foreign banks. Uh, Brent, crude oil. Well, so far so good. Nice persistent move higher. Yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Uh, keep in mind that an ETF is not going to give you as much bang for your buck as if you were to go to oil stocks and find a little little oil stock. Like NLG was one that I I was on a while back. You know, you're not going to get 100% move in that Brent, or at least not anytime soon. But find you a little oil company like that, and you can see you can get a, catch a big move over a short period of time. This is what you're looking for as opposed to the ETF. Nothing wrong with the ETF to gain some exposure. Yeah, we talked about that one. PFE, I'm not going to like. PFE is Pfizer. Uh, HV of 10, okay? Longer term, you're not going to beat the overall market. Oh, here we go. I'm talking about benchmarking. Well, you have to make money, right? And you want to at least longer term make more money than the overall market. Otherwise, why bother? But be careful and don't benchmark. Now, with that said, the only way you're going to beat the market longer term is with high beta. And I stick by that. I know there's been some studies and all. But if you're trading low beta and you get creamed on a position, then it's going to take a lot of low beta positions to get you out of that hole. And you're going to be a hurting pup for a long, long time. So be careful about theories when that uh, comes in. Realities are a lot harder, trust me. But, yeah, HV of 10, wide and loose sideways. Hasn't gone anywhere in months. That's not a Dave stock. Uh, those warrants, I've been seeing them. I, I don't trade warrants uh, anymore, at least. Uh, what is it, Bank of America warrant or something, BAC? You know, trade the the stock looks okay, um, but it's not much acceleration there. HV is not that great. Uh, I would pass. You know, you got so many stocks that are doing uh, fantastic now. IO from somebody who had to leave. IO looks okay. It's kind of um, a little crazy, though. It, it flat line. It took off. It came back in. HV is crazy. Um, I think I'd pass on this one. It's just too crazy. We go from an HV of 10 to an HV of 140. NVIDIA, NVDA. 
NVIDIA was doing really well based on the cryptos. Uh, now, here's a thick stock that might be worth trading, but you can see it just barely broke out to new highs here. So let's see if it can continue to break out and maybe trade some pullbacks along the way. There might be a stock within the sector that might um, have a little bit better trending characteristics you might want to take a look at. So I would drill down to the individual uh, stocks. LBRT. Um, is this a new issue? Because I'm only seeing these. Yeah, I don't know what's what's going on here. It looks like it's probably a new issue and they hadn't cleaned up the uh, one, two, three, four. We need at least five days before we consider an IPO. But yeah, put it on your list, I suppose. Can we talk about that one? Um, yeah, I mean, put this on your watch list. There's, there's quite a few IPOs that are on my watch list right now. Uh, maybe on a pullback. But yeah, definitely keep an eye on those IPOs. 20% more equitable W on WTS, 50% equals quadruple. You're saying you're leveraged on the... Uh, well, the, here's the problem with something leveraged. You're going to have to trade less. It's like, the, let's say you're, you're trading like a triple time share, a stock, whatever, triple time oil or triple time semiconductors, whatever the case may be, Sox X or whatever that stupid one is. S-O-X-S, is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay. That's Is that inverted? Anyway, the point is, let's say you're trading the underlining one would be one third the HV, one third the stop. So your stop is going to be three times wider. So if you're following my methodology, the leverage does not does not work in your favor. Okay. But I hear what you're saying. WLB short study. Uh, well, it's nothing for me here for a long, long time. You mean as a possible? Stored it as a possible short, you mean like a short study. You know, maybe back here there was a bow tie or something. But, yeah, there's nothing that uh, – there's nothing I'm seeing there to get me excited just yet. Sox L. That, oh, thank you, Gary. Yeah, let's take a look at Sox L, okay? So Sox L is triple on – it's triple Sox, okay? So it's 59. So let's take a look at the Sox. So the Sox is – why is my HV not working? Well, anyway, the socks, the underlying socks is going to be a third of the volatility as the SOX L. Maybe I need to calculate everything, data bank. Oh, here we go. Let's see if we can fix that. All right, while we're doing that, let's see. Q, C, U, E. Uh, yeah, it looks kind of interesting. Um, could be a little thin. It's an IPO. But, yeah, absolutely. Two ways to play it. Wait for a pullback, play the pullback, or wait for the next breakout. But, yeah, a little on the thin side. Biotechs are hot right now, again. Like in biotechs, I've always been a bit, bit of a biotech bug, but uh, or had that biotech bug in me. But, yeah, absolutely. Now, let's see if we get the SOX update yet. Nope, still not working. Okay. Anyway, trust me on that. You're going to have twice the uh, you're going to have twice the or three times the volatility of that. LGIH. This is going to be a REIT. Um, right now, the REITs are headed in the wrong direction. This one has been catching my eye. Uh, it looks okay. You've got a bit of a knockout. I'd actually like to see more of a knockout. It's persistent. You can't argue with that. And persistency will drive down your HV artificially. That's a kind of an advanced lesson there. But even with the persistency driving it down, it still is decent HV. So I would say this one's okay. Uh, again, I like a little bit more of a knockout. Maybe an entry up here. My only problem is... Um, REITs are not doing well, but maybe this is LGI Homes. I would look and see, are these like homes? Is this like more of a home builder? Uh, is it residential REIT? I mean, how does, what sector does this stock belong in? Because if we go to the actual REITs themselves, uh, you'll see that REITs obviously haven't been doing too good as of late. So 
you need to find a special reason why you want to be in that stock. I'm not saying use fundamentals, but I'm just saying look and see, does it belong in a different sector than it's lumped in? And can it, or if you really, really like the sector and you think you could trade contra to the overall sector, then that's great. But right now, I'd almost rather be in a, well, I'd actually rather be in a biotech or a semiconductor or something that's going the same way as the underlying sector and, of course, uh, the overall market, too. So all three pieces fit. Riot, long case study, or IoT. Well, Riot, you'd probably be chopped out, uh, stopped out by now. The problem with this stock is it's just gotten too, it's just too crazy, okay? So, yeah, it took off. It looked pretty good in here. And if you get rid of the scaling over here, you'll say, oh, wow, it took off. Let's play this pullback, okay? So that looks fantastic. The only problem is a little bit on the dangerous side because it ran from like, oh, let's say five and change. It ran up 400%. Oh, we can measure that. It ran up how much? It ran up 229% of a short period of time. Now, of course, if you're trading an IPO uh, breakout pattern, then you would have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, uh, daylight, Dave Light would, would, would have gotten you along in here somewhere either on this day here or this day and then it just flatlined afterwards so you'd have to have a a pretty liberal stop to avoid being stopped out on that but then yeah it took off out of a pullback and then uh because they used the word blockchain or something and now it's come all the way back in look at the hv 240 so that's become just way too crazy to trade so yeah don't beat yourself up it's something like that uh takes off without you yeah smh is a good uh, proxy for semis i agree so it's got an hv of 19 those triple things had what an hv of 59 so roughly three times as much that's my case is that your stop would be three times as wide on the triples as it would be on the smh so it all washes out and then the triples you're going to have tracking errors that are going to be abysmal because of leverage, and that's good. And there's other issues too, but that's the main one there. Now, I know people that like to trade these things intraday. You know, knock yourself out. What's what's the one? I mean, if you want to come in, and I don't know if you have anything today, but if you want to do some intraday day trading, which I would recommend you don't. Um, you know, maybe these things are something you could trade, but I wouldn't hold them longer term. For those aforementioned reasons, overstock. My only problem here is that it pulled back, and then this pulled back, pulled back until it's pulled back. Okay, this looks like something that if you were in longer-term trend-following mode, you'd be doing pretty good with, and you'd have a nice liberal wide stop. Unfortunately, uh, as far as a new setup, I would not go after. There's two different things. When it comes to trading, number one, would you take it as a new setup? And number two, would you hold it? Those are two completely different things. Early on, I always thought that a stock had to be always be a buy setup to keep holding it. And that's just simply not true. Sometimes when you're in longer term trend following mode, you write off these corrections like this. Even though you wouldn't want to jump in a new position, you certainly want to hold on to that old position. Let it correct, provided, of course, it doesn't take out your stop and just hold on for as long as you can. Okay, LGIH is considered a home builder. Okay, that's a different story. Okay, so that's fine. DNLI? Yeah, because the home builders look a little bit better. Now, this one's not jumping out of me right away, but these IPOs do have a bit of a Phoenix characteristic to them. And we don't have enough days to get all three bow ties in, but you can see that the bow tie moving average is coming together. Uh, it could rally off its lows, and this could be like a first thrust play, a bow tie play, or possibly you could even wait for it to make new highs, breakout play, or then a pullback play. Right now, not set up, but I hear you. Okay. And yeah, definitely put that on your uh, watch list. Can we talk about that one. Yeah, so you're saying if you were to short this one, 
Yeah, you know, I like to short off of all-time highs. I mean, I'm not seeing anything that jumps out at me. Obviously, you had a bow tie back here that might have been worth playing, but uh, I don't see anything that just jumps out at me. But I hear you, though. I mean, nice uh, – could have been a decent setup. DNLI. Oh, yeah, we just talked about that one. <laughs> Everything I just said. Okay, that one, uh, I, again, for some reason, we uh, I, I seem to have eliminated everybody's name, so I'm not sure who's asking. But that one's on the Landry list for today, and that is set up, and that is a buy. And I am all over that one. And we'll talk about it next week, hopefully. Absolutely. All right, any more? we got a few minutes left. While we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. Not sure whether we do one next week. But I do have one uh, show scheduled for the following week, uh, so I appreciate uh, appreciate that. Uh, anything that's unanswered, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. As far as individual stocks, it might be a little hard for me to get to all of those, but I'll uh, I'll do my best, especially if you're on the trading service. Uh, anyway, any questions, again, daviddavelander.com. Uh, just a reminder, trading full circles on sale half price until, I think, Monday. See the countdown pop down on my website. Everybody enjoy their weekend, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls either back on next Thursday or definitely, hopefully, God willing, the Thursday after that. Again, enjoy your weekend, and I'll see you uh, soon. Thank you.